Então nós vamos... É... Então é um prazer aqui ter vocês essa, com essa apresentação do Bruce Perrins. Ele vai se apresentar, né? mas isso faz parte de um programa de pesquisa sobre ciência aberta que a gente vem desenvolvendo aqui no IBICT, no âmbito do IBICT e do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciência da Informação. Nós temos aí um, uma quantidade de é, pesquisas, não só coordenadas por mim, mas também por alunos de mestrado, doutorado, pós-doutorado, iniciação científica. A vinda do Bruce ao Brasil, é, é, nós aproveitamos a oportunidade, o IBICT, junto com a Unesco, deu um apoio para a vinda do Bruce para participar do eHall, que é o primeiro encontro sobre hardware aberto que aconteceu em São Paulo, agora terminou no dia 31, agora de, de outubro. Então, o IBICT e a Unesco deram apoio para a vinda do Bruce e convidamos o Bruce também para fazer essa apresentação sobre um tema que eu acho que é ainda pouco conhecido entre nós. Né? Conhecemos muito sobre o software livre, mas é, como é que essa questão do hardware aberto, do hardware livre, enfim, tem várias denominações que eu acredito que o Bruce vai falar, qual é a importância disso em termos não só da ciência aberta, mas também da inovação e do que se chama hoje, que é esse emergente é, economia colaborativa. O Bruce ele vai se apresentar, vocês devem ter visto na, na, na divulgação, ele é um dos fundadores da iniciativa Open Source, que nasceu no movimento de software livre nos anos 80, nos Estados Unidos. Ele é também um dos pioneiros do movimento de hardware aberto e livre e ele é um especialista em licenciamento open source, open hardware. Né? E ele, inclusive, é CEO de uma, de uma empresa, uma organização, enfim que trabalha com, com, essa, com esse tipo de licença, esse tipo de replicabilidade do hardware também, tal quanto só. Então, a gente vai ter uma fase de apresentação dele e depois abriremos para perguntas, debates, etc. Eu pedi para ele falar pausadamente, para que seja mais fácil da gente conseguir entender o inglês, já que a gente não tem a tradução simultânea. Bruce. Thank you. So, good morning again, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I think she just said some of this in Portuguese, so forgive me for what I duplicate, but um, IBICT and UNESCO have just uh, sponsored another conference in uh, Sao Paulo, and so I spoke there. I did three panels and a keynote, so that was a lot of fun. So. Thank you very much for helping to pay for my trip to Brazil. And of course, I also went to Foz in between cities, so I had lots of fun. And um, I live in Berkeley, California, near San Francisco. Uh, I was one of the founders of the open source movement in software. And I was the first person to announce open source to the world. That was in 1998. And of course, in this, I'm standing on the shoulders of Richard Stallman, who did something called free software. Open source and free software are two different ways to market the same thing to different kinds of people. And so when we started open source, free software had already existed for at least a decade. And we decided to market it to business people. And you may know in English, free has two meetings, freedom and no price. So um, we did not want to scare away the business people with no price, so we called it open source instead. Uh, I'm the creator of some interesting software, including BusyBox, which is in many millions of phones and other devices in people's homes. Um, Wi-Fi access points uh, have it in them. Even though most people don't know it, it's in their homes. I was the second leader of the Debian project, and Debian is one of the founding Linux distributions. Uh, that is a distribution of the Linux operating system kernel with all of the user mode programs which make it an operating system. If you have just a kernel, there's nothing to give you a command prompt. So you then need to put it together with other programs. 
Uh, and today you would know Debian because Ubuntu and Mint, two popular Linux distributions, are derived from it, although Debian is still a living project. Um, I worked at Pixar for 12 years and in total 19 years in feature film. So I was educated in communication arts, computer science. I'm mostly self-taught, even though I have taught it at the master's level in three colleges. Um, and I'm credited on two of Pixar's films, Toy Story 2 and A Bug's Life. I was a operating systems kernel programmer for Pixar, so it was mostly programming the hardware and software interface of making movies happen. Uh, I have a book series called Bruce Perrin's Open Source Series, which is 24 technical books written by other people. I'm the editor. Uh, with Prentice Hall Publishers, and the books are under open source licenses, so you can now download the PDF of the books for free, but uh, the series still met all of the publisher's financial goals. Um, only one of 23 books lost money, and that was just too rarefied a subject for a general audience. Uh, and I'm featured in some films, Revolution OS, you can see, I think on YouTube and Netflix and things like that, and The Code Breakers. Um, I represented open source at the United Nations World Summit on the Information Society, which was a UN meeting in the world's biggest tent, essentially. It was a tent the size of a football stadium. And uh, I founded an organization called No Code International, and this lobbied for the elimination of a Morse code examination for amateur radio operators. It used to be that to get an amateur radio ham radio license, uh, you would have to learn Morse code and you took a test on how to listen to Morse code and write down the letters. I wanted to use amateur radio to teach young people electronics and networking and technology and not so much the antique side. So uh, it turned out that there was a regulation of the ITU, International Telecommunications Union, that required that all nations teach their radio amateurs Morse code. And this goes back to Morse code being the only common way of speaking to each other that they had. They had a set of three letter things that they could all understand in all languages and they could communicate them in Morse code. Well, that was nice, but mostly we use voice these days. Um, so I got the UN and ITU to change the treaty by lobbying in many nations and getting their amateur radio organizations to ask for this change. Now, this was difficult because many of the radio hams were old guys who said, we learned, why can't they learn? Well, we did not want to see amateur radio end in our lifetimes, and the number of people using it was going down. So we fixed that. Um, in the US now, we have more radio amateurs than ever before. Not so in some countries. I don't know how Brazil is. Um, I have two companies. Legal engineering is the one that makes money. It assists law firms and their customers with open source and other legal and technical issues. For example, this month I am working on killing a patent where the uh, owner of the patent is suing 20 different companies and it actually is in filmmaking. It's a patent about synchronizing lips in animation. And um, I'm also working with a company that uh, they infringed on the open source software. They combined it with their proprietary software without understanding the license. And of course, they did not want to make their proprietary software open source. 
And I help them separate the two pieces while still having them work together. And then I taught all of the engineers an intellectual property class and how to not get their company in trouble anymore. And I continue to work with that company. I visit them three days every month. Um, and, and it's interesting that I should find my way into helping lawyers, but uh, because I worked with open source licenses, I had to learn this. And then I found that I could pay for all of my open source projects by working with lawyers. Lawyers pay a lot. So I have very much free time when I'm not working with the lawyers and my family still gets fed and I get to work on open source. Uh, Algorand is my startup company and it's producing a software-defined radio transceiver. And the reason I needed this is because I've been working on a digital voice codec with a very smart uh, ham radio operator from Australia. His name is David Rowe. And we have an open source voice codec that can reproduce clear voice in only 1,200 bits per second. You can almost type that fast. And I figured out my phone has 115 gigabyte storage in it. I could record my voice for the rest of my life and never run out of storage at that rate. So um, it's very efficient and it lets us transmit voice over a very narrow voice, uh, very narrow RF channel, radio channel. Um, but I couldn't get any manufacturers to put the codec in their radio. So I decided it was time to have a good programmable radio that would be a platform for software development. And so I am attempting to make it. Hardware is hard to make. I had one design fail. I'm working on my second design. And um, this will be open source software and the hardware will be highly disclosed, but will not be open hardware until I'm finished making that model. And the main reason is that uh, I need to make money back from it. And if I gave everything away at this point, people in China would make it and sell it for less than I did, as they do, for example, with the Arduino. So, um, so we have a strategy for being open hardware and uh, also uh, making some money before we are open hardware. Um, so this is the new Brazilian synchrotron light source. And uh, they're using open hardware here. And so the Beam Diagnostics Group has funded and developed three open hardware electronic devices in the context of the serious electron beam position monitoring and control. And these boards are under an open hardware license. And these measure time to the billionths of a second because they are for particle physics where the lifetime of a particle is extremely short. And thus, they needed very specialized hardware. Well, these are developed in a community. And in my hometown of Berkeley, there is the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, where they have done similar development and have shared the designs with their friends in Brazil. And it was interesting when I got here and talked to the nuclear scientists, they all knew the people that I had met at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs in Berkeley, because it's really a small community. There are only a few synchrotrons throughout the world. And uh, so they shared these designs that were too specialized to get Agilent and Keysight to manufacture them, unless they charged really astronomical amounts for them. And of course, the, the people at the Synchroton knew what they wanted. They had worked out the designs with this community of other Synchrotrons. So it was better for them to have this manufactured from their design. Uh, and it's open hardware. So now another laboratory 
whether they work on nuclear research or something else, can take these designs and duplicate them. They don't have to sign anything. The license already gives permission. And uh, so these will be available uh, in the future. Uh, no one can stop you from making one. And they help with the experiments because the scientists can each see if we're making a time mistake. And as you may have heard a couple of years ago, CERN did make a time mistake. And it turned out actually to be a bad cable. Um, so it's very important for other people to audit how you measure time and, and make sure that you're not making that sort of mistake. Uh, so let's talk about the economics of open source because the biggest question everyone has about open source is how do you make money even if you're in the uh, public laboratory because all of the public laboratories serve the economies of their sponsor nations and everyone's sort of used to the Microsoft paradigm where you, you make software and then you sell it and you make your investment back. Uh, so most people don't understand how open source works economically. And once you understand the uh, economics of open source, it will help you to use it appropriately and it will help you to explain it to others so that they allow you to use it. I will give uh, Sarita the slides too. So it doesn't make sense at first. Giving away the right to use, copy, and redistribute your software source code or hardware design. How could that make economic sense? But as we see all around us, open source has been tremendously successful. And today, millions of profitable businesses and people participate in making it. And to mention just two, Google and um, eBay, oh, and Amazon, that's three, are built on a base of open source software. And I'll explain why the open source is the base, and then they build things on top of that. But is there some strange, non-intuitive economic principle at work? Well, we have a book in the States called Freakonomics about very strange economics. There are no strange economics. It's just economics. And sometimes people don't see the connections. So the conventional retail software paradigm that a company like Microsoft would use is that they collect investment, millions, $10 million perhaps, to start a small company. And then they work for a few years, and a product is developed, and then sold to users. And hopefully, this recovers the investment. And of course, during this time, they may try to go public on the stock market and thus sell the company at a markup and, and make them all rich. Um, so this only works for a subset of all desirable products. There were very many products that could never be developed using this commercial paradigm because no one wanted to invest in them and no one believed that they would be profitable. And for example, the web browser, the actual web browser that was built was very different from the web browser that was invested in. The Xanadu project was a project started by Ted Nelson to develop the web and it made sense. It made economic sense to the people at the time. They set up a system where you would get a very small payment for every word you wrote. And even when derivative works were made, the payment would move with them. So people who wrote for the web would immediately be paid for their writing. And uh, Autodesk, the CAD, Computer Aided Design Company, bought this project for $10 million and invested much more money. And it came to nothing because the monetary system was too complicated. And then Tim Berners-Lee, who worked for, and I believe still works for CERN, 
came along and said, I will make a web browser and server and I will do absolutely nothing about how to make money with it. I will let my users figure out how to make money. So we had a economic boom because everyone had great hopes for the web and people were paying millions and millions of dollars for domain names and then an economic crash when reality set in. And through all of this shaking around, we eventually worked out how to make money with the web. And that is how the capitalist system works. Instead of one person figuring out how to make money, everyone goes to work and we eventually get there. Some people succeed and the rest fail. And indeed, that's how open source works as well. So why do companies and organizations have software? to support their own operations, not to sell. In fact, 80% of programmers employed today write software that is not intended for sale. I have these figures from the United States Department of Commerce, which studies employment. So a small minority of companies actually sell software. In general, hardware is a tool in a company rather than the main profitable product. So many people have shovels, but only a very few companies sell shovels. Open source is a huge toolbox full of programs for teaching, serving web pages, emailing with customers, writing computer programs, designing integrated circuit chips, and thousands of other tasks. And there are two possible economic benefits from tools. The creator of a software tool might benefit from its sale, as might its retailers and wholesalers. And billions of people and companies can benefit from using the tool. And they can drive millions of businesses by doing so. So tool use is the largest economic impact. Tool use, not sale of the tool. Tools empower people to do some task that they could not do before as well as easily or at all. And that task is often part of a business that produces income. And there can be millions of such businesses. So the economic impact of using a tool can be much larger than the economic impact of selling a tool. And tools are wealth. A tool that extends the capabilities of a person is empowerment. And empowerment is wealth, not wealth that you can eat, just as you can't eat a shovel. But the work you do with a shovel or a software tool may indeed feed your family. So when people use open source, open hardware, open source software. They gain useful tools, usually at zero cost for the software, at low cost for the hardware. With open hardware, they get the designs for good, good tools that can be produced, and that at a low cost, because they don't actually have to put profit into the equation in many cases. And this gift can never be taken away. The open source licenses grant a perpetual right to use, modify, copy, and redistribute, give to others, so that anyone can service and extend the software or designs, and new users can always get it. So our first economic lesson from open source is that the users are the most economically important aspect of tools and that open source is a benefit to the economy because it produces great tools at the lowest possible cost, zero, and makes sure those tools will keep on living and enables many different companies and people, many aspects of the economy to operate better than they could operate without these tools. So it looks like charity, but most open source developers aren't developing open source as an act of charity, but as part of operating their own business. And so how can a business share their software with all of the world's users without going broke? The fact is that the developers are users too. 
They need the software to do something important for them, like operating part of their business. But unlike the conventional business model, open source developers share in the development. Many people in many different companies, universities, and also private individuals work together on one program. And by sharing in development, I'm going to talk economically now, they distribute the cost and risk of development so that nobody is giving too much and all the developers benefit. So compare this to the retail software development paradigm where we collect investment, we go to work, a few years later, we sell the product. So very front-loaded, costs millions of dollars, done by one small group. The open source paradigm may develop the same sort of software, does not collect money at the start, collects the work of some people, part-time, you know, sometimes at home. They work together. They distribute between themselves the cost of development so no one is putting in too much. And all of the developers benefit. Software is not their product. For most of the companies that are engaged in open source development, uh, their product could be farm produce or automobiles or anything. But most businesses today need software to operate at all. The particular software that open source is useful for is mostly infrastructure or an enabling technology, not the actual product. So a web server, for example, it's an enabling technology. You must have a web server to do business. Um, this is a very important point. Most companies have something about them that is a business differentiator. A business differentiator is a feature that is directly visible to the customer and makes that business more desirable to the customer than another. Uh, so I say for Coca-Cola, it's the flavor, and they have a secret recipe. For Amazon.com, it used to be their recommendation system. They were the first to have a system that said, if you buy one of Bruce's books, well, people who bought Bruce's book also bought this book, so would you like that too? And that more than doubled their profit because all of the cost of shipping to the customer was in putting the first book in the box and mailing it away. And then when they put the second book in the box, their expenses were correspondingly lower. So when Amazon had the recommendation system as a unique business differentiator, something that made them look directly better to the customer. They could not share this with Bertelsmann and Barnes and & Noble. But now, of course, everyone has a recommendation system, so this is no longer differentiating for Amazon. And that's another interesting lesson is that your business differentiators change over time as other companies catch up. But obviously, companies can't share their business differentiators with their competitor as open source, because if they do, their competitor will catch up with them faster. But they can share everything that they know about operating websites. Coke could share that with Pepsi without sharing their secret formula. And the major effect would be splitting a development cost, lowering the cost and risk of development for each company, and reducing expense. So Coca-Cola has soda sales in their profit center and web servers in their cost center. So what we're doing here is reducing a cost center expense so that we have more money to spend on our profit center. So what if you are a startup company? What do you do to succeed better with open source? You take everything that you need to do that you can get from open source and do it 
with open source or develop it in a community, then you take your business differentiator and you spend all of your software development money on that and no money on less money on things like web servers and websites, etc., because you can get all the infrastructure for that from the community. So open source provides a method to move your software budget into the things that actually make a difference to the customer. Now, you can make a mistake in what makes the difference. For example, do, do you remember BlackBerry telephones? Okay, BlackBerry, after iPhone came out, BlackBerry bought an operating system company that made something called QNX Nucleus. And they decided that the BlackBerry phone would be the most reliable because QNX Nucleus was an ultra-reliable operating system used to manage nuclear reactors. And they built this into their system. And all of the customers looked at it and said, well, great, it doesn't crash as often, but it doesn't run the apps that I want to run. So BlackBerry lost because they chose the wrong differentiator. So you must look very carefully at what is important to customers. And you must not have not invented here syndrome. Not invented here syndrome is the belief that we are smarter than everyone else and we can do things better than everyone else. You must be open to other ways of doing things from other people who are just as smart as you, even if they come from another nation. And um, that way you get what you can from them in open source and you concentrate on what is most important. And I have a, a way for you to learn about this, uh, which I do. I go stand in the Apple store. And of, of course, Apple uses open source, but Apple isn't about open source. They're about their proprietary software. And I stand in that Apple store and look around and ha at how happy and excited the people are because what they see from Apple is that they are getting a tool which is powerful and will enable them. They don't see the dark side of Apple, which is that Apple will only allow you to choose the tools that Apple approves of, and Apple will know everything about you. But that's for another talk. <laughs> and um, so, so go and do that, and, and you can get some intuition to what is actually important to customers. And you will never hear a customer in that store saying, what is your operating systems kernel? That is infrastructure that they don't care about. And that's why I tell companies, use Linux. Don't develop your own kernel, because Linux is free and the customers don't care. Um, so the way our communities work is that project leadership is by technical meritocracy. It is not by the marketing department. Uh, it has no power to force, only to persuade. And if any one company tried to force its agenda on others, the others would not cooperate. And surprisingly, we get a lot done that way. It turns out that putting the engineers in charge builds a better partnership than having the project directed by marketing or management. And that's because the engineers share a common goal of making great software while marketing and management often contaminate the partnership with their competitive aspirations. And my favorite example is the X window system was a consortium. They had pay for say in that you paid $100,000 and you got to sit on the board for a year and have your marketing people say what the engineers would make. So one day, the X window consortium board decided that they would not make a canonical user interface toolkit. They would not make the buttons and dials be the same across all of the Unix workstations. And they would not have the API be the same. And this was so that Apollo and HP and IBM 
could separately lock their customers into the API. And Microsoft was part of this board and must have been laughing into their sleeves because Microsoft would go on to make a common user interface toolkit for all manufacturers. And that was the day that Microsoft killed Unix in the market. It was that marketing decision that caused it to happen. And if we put the engineers in charge, of course the engineers would have made a canonical user interface toolkit for everyone and Unix would have been in a better shape. Well, we had to fix that. You know, engineers like me were very angry because it, frankly, we didn't like Microsoft Windows, especially 3.1, it wasn't very good. I worked for Steve Jobs and Steve said, well, Windows is taking over. This is of course between when Steve was at Apple, he, he had Next Workstation for a while and then he, had his office at Pixar, and then he was back with Apple again. Um, so Steve said Windows was taking over, and, and I hated it so much, and thousands of other people hated it so much that we made Linux really good. Uh, and so we, we sort of turned things around with the community effort. So forking is a very interesting power within open source. Forking is the right to take a project and split it off and take it in a different direction from the original developers without their consent. And people used to think this was actually a very bad thing about open source, but it turns out to be almost magical in its power. And we should call it the right to avoid bad management because that's what it's often used for. If other developers like your fork of the project, they'll come over to it and work with you and your version will prosper. And if not, only your work will be wasted, not that of the entire team. And in some cases, all of the developers of a project have forked away from one bad manager. This was the case with a later uh, instantiation of the X window system called X386. We had a manager who uh, wasn't going the direction that the engineers wanted to go, and the engineers all walked off and formed X.org, and that project flourished, and the old leader was forgotten, and, and that is technical meritocracy. Um, so this is. <laughs> I hope this works in Portuguese. The marketing paradigm of open source is a massively parallel drunkard's walk filtered by a Darwinistic process. So what does that mean? A massively parallel drunkard's walk means everyone does what they want to do. Everyone works on their own software idea and then everyone puts their software idea out on the internet and says, hello world, here's my software idea. If you like it, let's form a community. And some of the projects form communities and some of them die on the vine, wasting only one, people's, one person's work. Uh, so the good ideas and good leaders develop those communities, their projects expand and people with different ideas of how their project should go can always pursue them and, and build their community. So this actually gets us in directions that perhaps a marketer might not have gotten us in a conventional company because much as they would like you to think they can fathom the future, marketing has no crystal ball and they often make bad decisions. And critical to this is the control that open source gives you because you have the source code and the right to change it and you're not locked into someone else's agenda. Um, so in contrast, nobody can deny the role of Apple in today's world, but we should note one startling sign that their proprietary software is failing, and that is both Apple and Google spent more on litigation. In Google's case defense, this was in, I believe, uh, 
2012, when I was actually working on Google's defense in Oracle versus Google. Um, and uh, they spent more on lawyers and expert witnesses like myself than on all research and development. And, and what does this tell us? It tells us that our grip on intellectual property is ultimately bad for the production of real usable goods for people. Um, in, unless you like making lawyers rich. And you know, I've profited off of this because the rest of the world for me isn't open source. And, you know, it's, it's nice sometimes to take some money from that and put it back into open source, but I would happily give up all this intellectual property work if people just treated more things as open source. Um, so we have a new economic paradigm for producing excellent software that everyone can use. And it's all around us, and now it goes to hardware. So open hardware is the design of a physical object or an electronic circuit that is shared under the same terms as open source software. And the objective is to have the same sort of collaboration that occurs with open source software. Well, it turns out that copyright does not necessarily work as well for hardware as it does for software. And this varies between countries. For example, here in Brazil, you have a moral right of the author system similar to the United States copyright, uh, where it is the author who is most important. In the United States and England, we have a copyright system where the work is most important. And it turns out the copyright in the United States is weaker for hardware designs. Hardware designs there, and to some extent here, are the domain of patent rather than copyright. Um, so we have various uh, open hardware designs, which you're familiar of. The Arduino is a very inexpensive computer, very easily programmable for artists, students, and other projects. I just bought five for 20 US dollars on eBay. So they're now very cheap, and I can just put a computer in something the way I would have put a resistor a few years ago. Um, and the magical thing about Arduino is that it has shields, these hardware boards that you plug into it that do many different applications. So this particular one uh, goes in my car and tells the other amateur radio operators where I am. And, and it's very funny, I'll be sitting in uh, McDonald's and another ham will pop in there and say, I saw you in the neighborhood. Um, so. Um, why the Arduino? It has a community. It's 100% free software, including its hardware design. Uh, once you've used it in your development, you can take the AVR CPU that it's based on and use it as a part on your own printed circuit board. And, and at that point, it only costs a dollar to add in. Um, but it's only good for small projects. For larger ones, we use a full Linux system. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is very popular, but it's not fully open. Uh, it has proprietary boot and graphics code, undocumented coprocessors, but still very popular for a lot of open source projects. Uh, we have other interesting things. Someone made, uh, one guy made this little handheld oscilloscope which is very popular these days. Um, this is one of my favorite. It's called the Bus Pirate. It lets you hook into any computer bus and understand it and direct it. And it costs 30 US dollars. And um, so if you are a manufacturer and you think, I can't see that you have used open source in your product. I can take this and I can see everything about the insides of your product with it. Um, and of course, I can use it also to design new things because it, it provides you with a way of driving buses immediately. So you may immediately connect it up to parts and make them do things. And it has very many different protocols for using over those buses. 
this is for development of complex logic, uh, both analog and digital. Makes it very cheap. For gate arrays, uh, $50 gate array development board. Um, uh, and this is one of my favorites. It's a open hardware, so you can take the design and make your own if you wish. Thermal cycler for the polymerase chain reaction. So you can work on engineering DNA with this device. It, it gives me a little shiver that people are doing genetic engineering at home. And uh, of course, now they have CRISPR, so they can do very powerful things with that genetic engineering. Um, so like open source software and Linux, there are enabling factors that make this revolution possible. For Linux and open source, the internet was an enabling factor because it allowed us to have a worldwide community where before we all had to be pen pals. Um, uh, the frustration with the state of software was an enabling factor. The fact that many engineers like me didn't like Windows. Um, the extremely low point of entry to be able to produce software. You just need a laptop and the GCC compiler and you can go to work. And we don't even charge you for the GCC compiler. So let's consider the impact of the internet. Uh, I'm going to say some things, think about them as if it were 15 years ago. My friends and I are going to get together and write an encyclopedia. The authors aren't going to be paid, but we'll write 3,422,000 articles just in English, more in Portuguese. And we're going to kill Microsoft and Carta and Encyclopedia Britannica in England and most commercial encyclopedias that have been going for 200 years and made tons of money. Everyone who wanted their kid to go to college bought one. And uh, no more for those things. Encyclopedia Britannica doesn't even print anymore. It's only online. And so what would the response of most people have been had I said that to them just 15 years ago? They could not imagine such a thing as Wikipedia. So imagine telling someone this, two students' hobby projects will supplant the operating system and graphical user interface efforts of AT&T, IBM, and the billion dollar consortia of the massed computer manufacturers. They had one called Taligent and one called Monterey, and these were to rewrite Unix so that it would be better than Linux, and they got nowhere. Um, and they had big buildings and everything, and, and they worked for two years, and then they gave up. Uh, and, but if I had said this to someone 15 years ago, they'd say, are you using C++ or LSD? <laughs> um, so much of the evolution of open source is filled with things that would have been thought to be impossible a few years before they had happened. And thus, this is an emergent phenomenon. No one, with the possible exception of Richard Stallman, thought that it would take place until it was already underway. So we should look at the factors that combine to produce it and then look forward. So it used to be that when strange things happened, the news would report, police believe these are the actions of an isolated crazy person. There are no isolated crazy people in the age of the internet. <laughs> Whatever kind of crazy person you are, there are a hundred crazy people just like you. And when you, you can all meet on the internet. And when you have a hundred people with the same crazy idea and some spare time, you have more creative power than the typical startup company. Goodbye, venture capitalists. We don't need you anymore. Well, for some things we still do, but not for open source. 
So in the case of open source and Linux, we saw the rise of online communities that wanted to get something done. We saw the creation of this economic paradigm of open source that allowed us to share while still making money with our business differentiators. And um, this was very different from the way that companies typically created projects. So the way this started was that motivated individuals, for example, uh, Richard Stallman created GCC, the compiler, and Emacs, the editor, as some of the tools to make the tools, okay? These were tools that everyone else would use. So Lin Linus Torvalds came along and used GCC to com compile the Linux operating systems kernel. So you see we had tools to make the tools and these things go on. So broader development grows from those seeds and we have a multiplier effect as the ecosystem develops. As we make more tools, we can make more things. More people get involved. People see, hey, Google made billions of dollars. Maybe I don't understand something about this open source. And they get involved. OK, and it is happening again. Now we're in the same place that we were when Linux and open source software were starting up, but for hardware. And in the case of hardware, we have another set of enabling factors. Start with all of the enabling factors for open source software and internet to bring us together. The economic paradigm we created for open source the software tool collection, which we will use for the development, and everything that we've learned about collaboration, and the transformation of hardware into software. Okay, so hardware is software now. So 3D printers make it possible to print solid objects the way we used to print photographs, but if you have this extruder 3D printer, it's not very good, okay? My standard for quality is that before it's good, you must be able to print a well-working Lego block, okay? If you can make a well-working Lego block, you can make many other kinds of parts, and it turns out that Lego actually has very high standards. Um, the engineering for fitting the blocks together and having a very specific insertion and removal force uh, that's good for a child and that the thing won't fall apart when they've made it and frustrate them. That's actually a very careful engineering and, and specification. Um, so we now have ultraviolet lithography. This is the second generation of 3D printers which uses light rays to harden plastic. And thus, this is much more accurate than the extruder version. And uh, for example, my son is having his teeth straightened, and they are doing it with 3D printed parts that he wears in his mouth when he's not eating. And they're clear, so people don't see them. Um, and the Gatorade is a platform for us to develop immediately run, create and immediately run, very complex digital logic, and it runs faster than a program in a CPU because it all runs in parallel. Um, and there's no need for the tremendous infrastructure that we needed to make an integrated circuit before the Gatorade. When when we made an integrated circuit in the 80s at Pixar, uh, we designed it for half a year, we sent it away, and we got it back in two months. And it had better work because we could not wait another two months if we made a mistake. Um, now, you type in your design and it runs immediately, and if there is a bug, you can fix it immediately. So very big change, and these gate arrays are cheap, 
We also have complex programmable logic devices, which are the equivalent for analog, and the tremendous power of today's CPUs allows digital signal processing to replace the analog electronics of the past. Thus, I am working on software-defined radio, where we digitize the entire radio spectrum, for example, from zero, zero to 30 megahertz. We digitize that in one piece, and then we can separate one station out with the fast Fourier transform. Uh, so uh, many fewer analog components and higher quality than we could achieve in analog. Um, we also have cheap and fast manufacturing of printed circuit boards. Uh, so I have, uh, for example, sponsored the development of a 700 part printed circuit board uh, personally. And uh, it cost about 5,000 US dollars to prototype. Um, so let's get to science. Duplication is a key part of the scientific method. If another lab can't duplicate your experiment and get the same results, it's not science, and you will have to withdraw your result. And we've seen, for example, uh, the Italians made a forecast about some atomic particles, and no one could duplicate it, and they, they took it back. They don't know if they made a mistake or not. Um, but when you can't duplicate the result, you can't really say that it's science. It's also necessary that we give a very detailed description of our experiment so that if we get something wrong, other scientists can show our mistake even long after our experiment is done. So we get back to open source and open hardware because they enable another researcher to exactly duplicate the tools that I used in my experiment. If I use open source and open hardware, I can directly give that researcher the source code. I can give them the hardware design, the files used to print the circuit boards. For example, the timing system used by the Brazilian synchrotron and also used by Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Now, a good researcher will use this information to understand the other laboratory, but might develop his or her own tools and a different path of investigation, and that is to check for bugs. We don't want to have the same bug fooling two different laboratories, but we do want to have both laboratories understanding exactly what the other did and once they have confidence in the tools, sharing the tools among themselves because that lets them get to the work instead of spending more time making tools. Uh, so as I showed, the Brazil lab and, and the lab next door to me in Berkeley make the same equipment. And they could have uh, shot this out, say, to Agilent or Keysight. But if they did, uh, when I worked for Hewlett Packard, we made five times the cost of fabrication on the margin of our test equipment, for example, spectrum analyzers. And that was because it had a, a rarefied market. And we would not sell very many of them, so we had to recover the cost of development. Now, for the nuclear laboratories, you only have seven customers. So the margin would be 20 times perhaps. Well, the laboratories don't necessarily want that. They can do this by themselves, and they're actually more comfortable to do so. Um, but when they specify things to be manufactured and designed outside, these days CERN specifies designs must be under the open hardware license because they pay for the design, and they want the design rights back. And thus, uh, all everyone could use these designs, but they will probably go to the same person who made them because they're already set up for manufacturing them. In the US, we have the International Trafficking in Arms Regulations. And this does not only 
uh, govern distribution of AR-15s. It governs rocketry and satellites and digital voice compression like that which I work on, nuclear research tools, and I also uh, volunteer for AMSAT, which is the Amateur Radio Satellite Program. And um, how would AMSAT or my digital voice project cooperate across nations? Because I'm working with an Australian amateur. In the case of AMSAT, we work very extensively with the Germans. And um, in ITAR, uh, they did not, not do this out of kindness. They did it because we sued them. Uh, there is a carve out for information that is in the public domain. So if you put your information out to the public, ITAR does not restrict its transfer to other nations. So uh, projects like um, the open uh, quadcopters, they have an open pilot software that is put in open source because they could not share the development with the community across countries otherwise because of course it can if it can fly a quadcopter it can probably do a missile also so the military would be a little worried about that um, and as long as AMSAT makes its development open source and open hardware and publishes it as soon as they work on it they can share it across other countries, and this applies to your laboratory as well. Now we get, we're getting to the end of the speech, um, we get to technology transfer, which is how we as laboratories transfer our technology to the public. And of course, in the United States, we have an awful method of doing this, which was we patent everything and we sell the patents, perhaps to the highest bidder, perhaps to a company that's affiliated with one of the researchers, so they're already in bed together. And um, then that company has a monopoly on the invention, which is paid for with public funds. And um, it may be that you, as a taxpayer, pay public funds to make an invention and you have a company and your company um, is sued by the owner of the patent for an invention that you actually paid to develop. So there's some injustice fundamentally in this at times. Um, but the company may not develop the patented technology after paying for it. They may have bought it to slow down other companies. Uh, or they may fail. Um, so the monopoly patent transfer model is necessary when there's a high cost of investment necessary to productize the invention and thus a high return on investment is also necessary. So for example, with a drug, this might be the case. It might cost billions of dollars to develop the drug and and then in the states to get the government to actually approve the drug takes very extensive testing, which itself might cost billions of dollars before we will allow it because we still remember thalidomide in the United States, which took off the arms of children. Um, so for other sorts of inventions, though, where the cost of development of a product is low, the monopoly patent model is inefficient. Because software development, you just need a laptop. You don't need a billion dollar investment. Um, so in general, failure of any new product development, either technically or within the market, is more likely than not, especially if you give it to only one company. So what if you gave it to 1,000 companies rather than one, and you didn't charge them anything? You gave it to the whole world. It is much more likely that one will succeed in implementing use of the invention than if you gave it to only one company. And thus, your end result, which is benefiting people 
as a public organization is better fulfilled by taking your inventions and publicly disclosing them, putting them out in open source if it is economically possible for people to develop them as products at low expense, not at high expense. Then you can use the patent, the monopoly holder. Are we kidding ourselves about our patents? Okay, the only way to enforce the monopoly right granted in a patent is to bring lawsuits. And engineers are instructed, every company I work with, don't look at patents because it actually helps to get your company sued if you look at them. And it can cost a company 10 million US dollars to defend themselves in a patent lawsuit and win. Okay, if you spend 10 million dollars to win, is that really winning? No, it is not. You may have bankrupted your company on the way. There is really no justice here, especially for the little guy. The little guy cannot afford to be in this case and has to settle with the patent holder for whatever terms they like. Uh, now, my own expert witness business will charge a tremendous amount of money on this. The lawyers charge twice as much as I do. So you will be spending more than a thousand US dollars for every hour that you were in the court. Now, I submit that the patents produced by publicly funded research are today used more to impede the development and utilization of technology and feed attorneys and experts than they are actually used to put technology in the hands of people. So our new model is use open source instead. And when you use open source, it provides prior art to prevent others from patenting the same invention. And uh, I have the record of being the first person to do this, a program I released in 1981 called Electric Fence, invalidated a patent uh, by AT&T. Uh, it was prior art for uh, one of the patent claims in AT&T. Uh, voluntarily withdrew the claim when they became aware of my previous work. And uh, interestingly enough, the people who worked on that at AT&T years later became open source developers and I met them. Um, when you want everyone to use something and you want them to develop their own proprietary products based on it, use permissive open source licensing. That means the BSD license, the MIT one, or the Apache license. And that lets everyone do what they want, and they don't have to give back to the community, but they can still give back to the community when they wish to. And we have a sharing with rules license called the GPL that says you must give back if you make a derivative work a work based on my software under the GPL must be given to the public with the same terms, with the GPL terms. That means new development must be shared with the GPL rather than may be shared with the BSD, MIT, or Apache license. So I personally use the GPL because big companies aren't paying me to make the software. And I want them to be development partners rather than just give them a big Christmas present. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, as a public laboratory, you've already been paid for the development. It's perfectly within your mission to give big companies a Christmas present. So using the BSD, MIT, or Apache license is uh, often a good thing to do. Um, so that's what I have to say today about open source and open hardware. Uh, I'm a little hard of hearing, especially after I've been shouting for an hour. And so um, please uh, try to ask your questions in English and, and we'll have people translate again for me if I have to. Any questions, please? Bom, é, obrigada, professor. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for your presentation.
E agora, é, queria é, thank uh, uh, Ronald Sherrod, Dr. Ronald Sherrod, the director of CBPF, is here. Thank you very much for allowing us to... Which one? Which one? Oh! Which one here? Okay. <laughs> I figured it would be another gray-haired guy. Thank you. <laughs> Bom, então está aberto. Quem quiser fazer perguntas, se alguém tiver dificuldade com inglês, a gente tenta aí ajudar na professor Shella, que é a ordem. Can I can I start just by observing that uh, I mean Linux is great, nevertheless, I mean still Microsoft dominates. Uh, uh, Computers. Yes. Um, so the the question really is, well, you've done really well, but how come you haven't taken over the world? Well, first of all, um, when I started working on this, uh, oh gosh, I guess about 1990, that was uh, when Linux was still in 0.9 with a bunch of digits after it, you know, just started. And uh, so it's only been 16 years. Um, second, I don't really have to rule the world. I'm quite content to just have a part of it. And um, the other thing is that although I have entire talks on how to make money with open source, um, we, we don't have to eliminate the proprietary software paradigm. Um, so one answer to the question is, well, why does Microsoft still dominate? And, and actually, it doesn't so much. You can see the impact of Microsoft being reduced, but perhaps being taken over by companies like Google and Amazon, uh, because obviously the cloud and the internet have become important, and Microsoft is not quite caught on. And if you look at Google and Amazon, they are to a very great extent based on open source. Um, also, Microsoft, um, you know, we, we never imagine this would happen, but Microsoft is a very enthusiastic participant in open source development today. And um, so I have converted Darth Vader to the <laughs> bright side of the force. Um, and, uh, you know, I used to do debates against a Microsoft representative at a, a, a speech like this. And, Now it's rather harder because they can talk from my side as well as their side. Um, so, um, no, I, th I think we've done just fine in, in 16 years. And you can look at what your organization, I'm sorry, is it? No, it's longer. Um, gosh, we've been doing this almost 26 years, haven't we? And um, so you can look at what your organization has done in the same time. and I. I I'm sure, you know, not so different. Um, and, and also, revolutions never work out the way you expect. And I'm actually very happy that the revolution did not eat this leader, as revolutions do eat their leaders. And uh, even the peaceful ones. And some of my colleagues are quite burned out now. Yes, sir. I, can I, I comment? I, I think it is a paradox because nowadays I cannot even manage a, a Windows uh, a thing. I mean, I, Do I you don't like it? It's, it's not a question of like. I don't even cannot. I don't understand anymore. I mean, which is this is the paradox. I mean, uh, it's much easier to use Apple, Linux, and which and nevertheless, I mean, it, it doesn't dominate. This is what is a paradox for me. I mean, Windows is, is more clumsy nowadays, much more okay. difficult to use. So, as a, so what's happening, I believe, over time is that people are stopping their belief in Microsoft and Microsoft's dominance. And, and Microsoft's dominance is really based on everyone thinks of Microsoft as dominance. So that'll do business with Microsoft. Um, 
Apple is very strong, obviously. Um, my problem with Apple is corporate totalitarianism. Uh, I, I think that, um, well, for a while, my wife and my son had iPads or iPhones. They're back to Android now. And I think in the case of the uh, Android phone, my, my son actually sold off his iPhone. He felt that Android was much better. And uh, in the case of uh, my wife, I think that it was mostly that Android devices were less expensive. And she didn't really care which one she was using. Um, but what I find is that, um, and of course, Android has lions in it. It has very many proprietary things in it as well. Um, what I, I find is that to do anything out of the ordinary with Apple, I must ask. If my device breaks, I have to have Apple on the phone or I go to the genius bar. You know, if he's a genius, he's not behind that desk. And um, if uh, I want an app to be usable by the public, it must be approved of Apple first. And, and of course, Apple does this because they don't want you doing evil things. But it also means that Apple has control. And for example, if you put a web browser on the Apple platform, it, it must use Apple's rendering engine. So you will notice that we're up to iOS 10 now. iOS 10 has still not implemented the web audio API fully, which I need for my two-way radio for it to be controllable with my phone. Uh, if you use uh, Google Chrome on Apple, it's using that handicapped rendering engine. Okay, now, if you use Google Chrome on Android, Chrome can do what they want, so they have the web audio API fully implemented, and thus JavaScript can take my camera and microphone and send it over my radio. So, we see these sort of small impacts of corporate totalitarianism. Corporate totalitarianism, and don't always consider what the larger impacts can be. Um, and this is actually a, a social justice and national sovereignty issue. Um, these are, to a great extent, United States companies, and they shouldn't necessarily be running Brazil or Argentina or wherever. And thus, uh, whenever I am in other nations, I, I do see uh, people for whom resistance to the large American companies is a valid issue. And I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of leaders of countries. Uh, Monty in Italy, I met one of the prime ministers of Canada, I met uh, Aristide in Haiti, a number of others. And, and this corporate totalitarianism issue is a concern for some of them, even though, of course, they love to have the employment that these companies provide. Um, so one of the things that I do today is I talk about security. Because uh, when you have the Apple product or any proprietary product where you don't have source code, you don't know what's going on in there. And open source does have security bugs. Remember Hartley, for example. But we find them and we fix them. For every bug that there is in Hartley, uh, Microsoft's implementation of OpenSSL, of course theirs is closed, has had the same sorts of bugs for an equivalent period, and they are still not prepared. Because with the Microsoft system to find them, you must disassemble the instructions. You can't see the source code. So only the bad guys look, OK? Whereas the good guys look at source code because they're trying to fix it or extend it, and thus they come across the security uh, errors. And uh, Eric Raymond said, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. Well, it took us years to find that open SSL bug. It 
this is very complex and because it's cryptography, not many people were qualified not to look that we eventually did find it. Um, and it turned out that everyone was using OpenSSL you know, uh, into it for Quicken and very many other companies. Well, why? Because it was free. That was also a problem because only one guy was working on that software and no one paid for the support of that software. And thus we did not find the bug as quickly as we might have if it were both open source and the developers were better supported. So I would have changed a license on OpenSSL many years ago. I would have made it the GPL and I would have made a separate commercial license for the same work so that it would be free for everyone who wanted to share and for the people who wanted to pay and could pay they would pay and they would not have to share their own software and the developer would be supported and he would be looking at security well now that the horse is out of the barn we fix that problem by developing another way to support those developers but one must consider the economic aspects of these problems, even when it's open source, sometimes it's so hard that you must have a paid person working on it. But even then, it's still more secure if you can see it. So your freedom is protected when you use open source, and your national sovereignty is protected when you use open source, where it might not be. More questions, anyone? Yeah, I have one. Uh, I have been in Washington you know, talking about the dark side of Apple, and I would like to uh, know about your opinion of the struggling uh, on iOS system and Android. Uh, for many years, uh, iOS and Apple had the big have been the big sellers of the iPhone and got a lot of money from it, but uh, the type is changing currently, and I would like to know about your opinion. Okay, so Apple. Yeah, I, I just have another yes. second question uh, after that, that is a book called Hacking Capitalism. I don't know if you read I, it. I've not. Uh, but why don't you email me? Okay, and uh, <laughs> it's Bruce at Curtis.com. If you can spell my name, everyone can get it. Okay. Phone number really gets to me. Um, wait, wait. Ah. So one by one, or we. No, one by one is fine, and, and of course, I'm sure some of you have things to do, so I will not have hurt feelings if you have to leave. And um, so, uh, about Apple versus iOS and, and the competition between them, well, I would have loved for it to be an open source platform that was winning the market, and we didn't. Okay, it doesn't mean we'll never have another chance. Uh, to some extent, Android is an open source platform, but that is less and less the case. Um, and uh, Apple is a lesson to be learned from. They, they do not win because they're corporate totalitarians. They win because they are very smart about doing things for the user that the user can understand. And, and they make it pretty. And, and they weren't the first to invent this. They took the Apple look from uh, Bang and Olafsson, the stereo manufacturer in the 1980s, and um, uh, an uh, instrumentation manufacturer named Brule and Carr. Uh, and uh, so there were other companies with this design in the very rarefied, expensive stereos at the time and, and laboratory instruments. And so Apple created a device that you would covet, that you would emotionally wish to have, 
and, and that you could use. And, and advertised it that way, marketed it as the computer for the rest of us, rather than the geeky, nerdy hackers. And um, uh, so to that extent, there are lessons to be learned from. The um, competition and the sort of thrashing in the market will always happen. That's just how capitalism works. I wish that less of it were about patents. Um, what essentially happens is that the large companies have fights about patents in which they cross license each other, uh, they have expensive lawsuits, and they eventually get their business carried out, although they may pay each other half a billion dollars once in a while to do it, while it is actually the little guy who gets hurt by this because they can't play at that level economically. Um, so that is uh, one of the damages. The, the other damage is that so far myself and other people in my community have not sufficiently convinced the average person that sh they should be aware of the degree to which this controls everything you do. It controls the way you uh, communicate with your friends and colleagues the way you get news and the, the degree to which news is extensively falsified. You know, much of the news that we, we read on these things is not true. And we have not necessarily a good way of telling that. Um, it uh, has a microphone with no off switch. It has a GPS. Uh, this is worse than anything George Orwell could have imagined. Uh, and you know, I, you have five or six charging in your bedroom. Think of the implications. And so um, this is um, something I have yet to convince people who aren't scientists or computer engineers about that this is actually important to your freedom and to the sovereignty, sovereignty of your country, and perhaps individuals should think a little more about taking control of this thing because of that. Uh, this, this is a mission I have not won yet. Um, we had another question. Uh, so, uh, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Felipe Moreira. Hi. I'm from the Federal Center uh, at the uh, technical, technological Education uh, from Rio de Janeiro. I'm studying electronic electronics engineering, and I hear uh, really uh, excited to be here because I knew about all of your history, all your things. Anyway. Oh, you're a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll stop you for a moment. I was at a trade show for my company, Algorand, where I was showing <laughs> software to find radios. Um, and the people at the show were radio amateurs, ham radio operators, because they are my early adopters. While I can sell to the police and the firemen afterwards. So I was showing at the show, and a fan walks up and says, you're the Bruce Perrins. <laughs> and my wife and my son are helping in the boot. So they're seeing all of this. And, and they know I have fans, but they, they don't see the daily interaction with them. And he says then, seeing them, I never thought that you were a normal person with a wife and a family. <laughs> My wife has used this line on me over and over since then. Whatever I do, I never thought you were a normal person. Um, go on with your ass. Is there when you imagine some crazy guy in a room, locked down, like by years doing things and inventing things? And yeah. Anyway, I, I'm also surprised that you have family. Uh, just one quick question, another more complex. Uh, 
you talk about gate array. Would this thing be like FPGA, like gate array? Gate array. Oh, gate array, FPGA. Same it's thing. Like the same thing. Same thing. Ah, okay. FPGA, field programmable gate array. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, ah. No, just one more. Yeah. Just more complex. How how do you see the the global the future of the global economic with the adventure the of the collab collaborative economics like like changing everything? Uh, like I'm just questioning about this because we have a big vision of this, and also I'm also looking for this and I cannot ignore that. The, the actual economic that we are using is, is bad for us. Like the capitalist paradigm. Yeah, not not only this because like it's it's keeping up us like away from the develop the development the holding the the way of the world. Yeah. Like, like it's crazy because if yes. it was everything like you said like open source open hardware. You don't need to like the profit is is is, is okay. keeping the profit away from us. Uh -huh. You know, okay. because the profit the, the way it means is not the way that we use. Because if everybody was doing everything together, we would have much more profit. Like it's, I think it's crazy the way we use now. How do you see this okay. this thing with the future of the collaborative? Uh, okay. Things in the global economic. Do you think? Okay. So the question is. No, anyone has a uh, complementary question related? Yeah. To so the, the question is, how do I see the collaborative economy growing? And, and well, first of all, if I had a really good idea how things would go, I would be investing in the stock market. <laughs> um, and and uh, there are many surprises. This has not gone the way I thought at all. I think that we have some problems because um, we are seeing an increase in international treaties which mandate intellectual property restrictions. Uh, I don't know how this translates to Portuguese, but the one uh, most recently worked on, I believe, is TRIPS, T-R-I-P-S treaty. And uh, this would require, I know, in the United <coughs> States that we protect some things as intellectual property that are not protected today or protect them with more restrictions. And this is presented as a way of making our businesses more profitable and having us share more as nations, and it may indeed do the opposite. And uh, I feel that you as academics need to be the thought leaders in keeping intellectual property open. And um, when you can, as I do, speak about these issues, it makes other people understand and believe, and you can actually change, as I change, you know, a small thing, the licensing for radio amateurs and Morse code, that one person can really have an effect on these things. And one of the things that you do is, as an evangelist, you spawn other evangelists. They hear you, they believe you, they talk to their friends, etc. So if you, as I'm sure you do, if you feel bad about things, maybe so bad for me, they cut me up at night. I felt so bad about some of these things that were going the wrong way in the law. I found that if I sat down and wrote about them and published how I felt, I could then go to bed. <laughs> now, these days I'm older and I can go to bed when I want, but uh, I still do that writing and, and I very much recommend writing and speaking as a way to give yourself power over these issues in that you evangelize and convert other people and uh, they will feel much better once you start doing that. Um, uh, so, so how will it go? Well, we have uh, a new generation coming where we have autonomous cars and autonomous cars have 
all sorts of complications related to safety. And you can't necessarily let the open source world into your autonomous driving computer because it might drive you into a tree. But you might want to have development which people then audit. And so uh, in my attempt to actually create an open market where automobiles would come with a plug and the driving computer would be changed because we know that that computer will not be uh, usable after three years. That's how the development is progressing very quickly. If you are on the road with a three-year-old computer, it will not be as safe as modern computers. So um, I wrote a legal paper with a teacher from the University of California Berkeley Law School. It's called Bolt All. Uh, very good school for lawyers. And we have uh, gotten that paper accepted in the uh, Berkeley Technology Law Journal, which is the most prestigious technology law journal in the States. And uh, it will be out in the summer or perhaps the spring. And that's actually, I've, I've had legal speeches accepted at law conferences, but that's the first law paper I've had accepted as a computer programmer and filmmaker, not a lawyer. Um, so I'm trying to work on these future things and, and very much encourage you to sit down and think about, well, what could happen? You know, do science fiction in your head and start to work on the possibilities. And uh, that can be very helpful. Is there time for more questions? Yes, yes. Two questions here. That side. I have a question. No, actually, introduce yourself. Okay. Anyone else on this side? Andy and Me? One, three questions, OK? Yes. Yes. OK. Hi. I'm a um, student of a PhD here at Indeed, and also a teacher. Okay. And my name is Moisés. It's good to meet you. And, <laughs> and as I understand, open source is a model. Yeah. And I, my question is, this model can be applied in other things than software and hardware. Uh, for example, uh, manufacturing clothes. Can I, can I apply this, this model? Well, the design of a clock could be open hardware, and the sharing of the design of a clock could be shared and developed under the terms of open source. So I will share uh, a similar thing, uh, which was in a paper by Javier Serrano, a nuclear researcher um, at CERN. And I haven't had time to put it in my own slides. Um, there is an open source project for making artificial limbs. And this was not started by any engineers or scientists or doctors. It was started by the parents of children who needed prosthetic limbs and were frustrated with the functionality and quality that they could get in a prosthetic limb store. And if they wanted to have the most effective, individually engineered prosthetic limbs, they had to be very wealthy, or perhaps they had to put in money that they would be spending for that person's college education. OK, so people who were not formally, formally trained, people who were not scientists and engineers started a community for the development of prosthetic limbs using 3D printers and have a effective community. And of course, everyone must be customized, but they can share the general design. And they have 2,000 users. And, and the people who started this, they were moms. They, they were not anyone who works here. And um, although I'm sure lots of moms work here. And um, so I'm, I'm very proud of them. And that is the sort of thing where the economics just did not work for them. 
the only people who were making these things were people who could make themselves very wealthy by charging a very large amount. And uh, so this is a place where we had an underutilized economic niche, a niche that the capitalist paradigm was not filling. And I, I do not say this as a communist. I have a, a very lucrative business. But capitalism does not work without a commons. And this is one of the places where the commons is more efficient. Um, so it's, it's that sort of thing that you can share. Now, clocks also, if you look at the work done by the nuclear researchers, which I showed, those were really timers. Mm -hmm. So um, in fact, we have an online community, which if you are an engineer, I recommend for its obsession, obsession and craziness. Uh, the community is called Time Nuts. And they are people who, at home, have extremely high precision time and frequency measurement equipment. And uh, there are quite many of them, and some of them are scientists as well, but many of them are lawyers and other things. And they just happen to have a rubidium clock in their bedroom. And um, so uh, take a look at that if you can. I think you might find it very entertaining. More questions, please. Two more questions. Annie and then I'm here. <laughs> well, nice to meet you. Uh, my question is about common single okay. I am studying these two paradigms, and they, they both deal with epic structures. So I was wondering, uh, I was recognizing these enabled aspects that you were talking about open in commons as well. But there is a difference because open deals with this hacker figure and meritocracy. And commons nowadays deals more with the, the figure of the Ocupa, people that are occupying places, infrastructures, oh. and diversity. So I was wondering about this and the uh, Sometimes uh, it feels that the open paradigm is about a rational decision, like the best solution wins, like in your Darwinian process. And we do not talk ab much about politics here. And in commons and occupy movements, it's all about uh, political decisions. So I was, and the stronger, also wins here, but the strongest with economic power, media, and everything. So um, I was wondering if the Kupas are dealing with the city as a hardware, dealing with the, the cities the the city as, city hardware. as a hardware, uh, what we can learn from the open paradigm? Okay, so the, the question if I can paraphrase is. Um, we have the various political movements which attempt to take back the power of the people from the plutocracy. Okay, the plutocracy is the people with the most money who can pay to be political, pay to have politics work as they choose. You know, in general, in intellectual property, for example, the drug companies have bought the best Congress they can get and thus they manage the intellectual property that way. Um, the real key, I believe, is communications. And um, uh, another good point I got from Javier's speech at the other conference is the Greek definition of idiot is a person who does not care about politics. Because politics, in the end, is as important as the breath you breathe and so um, we have the ability now, as we never had before, for the individual who chooses to speak and write to have the same distribution that in 1980 would only have been granted through television network or newspaper. Um, and Thus, the communications of the public, I think, are the very most important thing that we can utilize. And you know, 
put more in to these communications to interest people and have your communities operate. Um, the one thing that separates you from CNN or some big news source is interest. If the interest is there, the people will come. Um, and having done this, what do we do? Well, unfortunately, the Occupy movement has been disappointing in that they got the first part, that you know people should lead and we should make some noise about it. And they did not get the second part, which was developing leaders who could speak their case coherently and lay out a workable political agenda that people could get behind. So the Occupy movement managed to make it impossible for some people to work in their offices for some days and got on the news, but was not able to transition that into political change. And within the movement of power of the people, the lesson of how that is done needs to be propagated. And uh, the unfortunate thing with riots is that many of the participants in riots are just there to steal things or have fun. They're not there for political purposes. Um, so, you know, we, we got halfway with Occupy. I would love to see it go the rest of the way. And I do work on politics very extensively because intellectual property is, is an area in, in which we need to say very much. Um, and I could talk about this for another hour, but I should. <laughs> Um, Last question. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, nice to meet you. I believe that my question was pretty much answered in your answer to them. Okay. But uh, I'm not an engineer. I'm from the Virginia Institute of Information Science and Technology. So, uh, oh, he's then, only from the Institute of Information Science and Technology. Uh, he's not an engineer. Mm -hmm. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> 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 So uh, uh, I'm looking on the uh, social and political aspects for uh, what you're talking about, and uh, I'm also concerned with the fact that, uh, as you pointed out here in Brazil, uh, everything has to do with authorship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, legally speaking. Yeah. And uh, uh, when it comes to authorship, uh, there are other concepts that, in terms of government information. Uh, we need to have access to information that is reliable, authentic, and all the uh, trustworthy and all the things that make information uh, useful. Yeah, but when you bring this to the collaborative work and this idea of sharing information to build things, and, uh, and people try to apply this page, the same speech. Uh, if, it's the, if it was done collaboratively, maybe it was not. Uh, it's not reliable. It's not trustworthy, and even authentic. And when and you, and you for instance, you said that uh, public patents, a patent developed by uh, government institutions, and they are used against people uh, so that they don't develop other things. Uh, so this speech of what is uh, produced or created in a, in a very uh, controlled environment is the only thing, the only way to get things work. It doesn't work in that sense because, uh, I mean, what do you think about it? Because uh, how, how far can I take this speech of uh, having a controlled environment uh, can be the only way of developing things if you're not talking about government information. I understand that government information is very sensitive, but we're not talking about this only. So, so we try to lead by example. So, um, for example, when I left Pixar, I left uh, to work on open source. That's leaving Pixar, the greatest movie studio in the world. People would hate me for leaving there. and. I, I walked into Steve Jobs' office, and Steve and I knew each other pretty well. And I said to Steve, well, we still don't buy this open source stuff. This is the year 2000. And Steve says, well, you know, I had a lot to do with making two of the world's three greatest window systems. 
and we ne needed a billion dollar laboratory to make everyone, so I don't think you're going to succeed with this open source stuff. Two years later, Steve stands on the stage of Mac World and introduces the Safari browser, which is based on the KDE open source project. And Steve stands in front of a slide that says, open source, we love it. And so I won that argument. Uh, Steve, of course, never acknowledged it. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, so, um, Oh, and I had to tolerate going to vegetarian restaurants with him for so many years. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so many uh, lessons like that uh, can be taught. And what I would do if I could, and this is not done in a day, is I would evangelize trying different technology transfer methods to the scientific institutions. Because, uh, first of all, they're up against the Americans who are very grabby in whatever collaborations they have. And uh, they're not necessarily doing the best for their own people or for anyone. And so to the extent that we can make more use of open source in our technology transfer paradigm, I would uh, uh, have you evangelized to other researchers, well, why don't we ask for this? Why don't we do it routinely where our projects can make use of it and, and make this something that can just be a checkbox when we do a project at uh, this institution? Uh, and that has been successful for some researchers in some